Welcome to Adventure Thinking, an intimate series of live video podcasts that explores the mindset born from challenge, adversity, and living a life of no regrets. I'm Jonesy, your host, and for the past 20 years, I have been lucky to have embarked on some crazy expeditions. And I'm Lauren, your other host, and I haven't. And return transformed with some pretty epic tales to share. I'm more of an accidental adventurer. You just start to question why you're doing it. Each week, I'll be bringing adventure stories. Uh, we'll be bringing? And mindsets down from the proverbial mountaintop as we dive into the hearts and minds of some of the world's greatest adventurers. These are people that have achieved truly phenomenal undertakings against all odds and have returned better for it. So, do you want to live more adventurously? This is Adventure Thinking. All right, Lauren, how are you doing today? Well, cheers. It's 9 p.m. I feel like we've been on an expedition getting the kids in bed and one's not in bed. So she might be coming in. <laughs> Let's be honest. We have pushed off our parenting duties to the iPad. So she is currently binging on iPad at 9 p.m. and she's four and a half. Not our highest parenting moment, but you got to do what you got to do. So here we are. So you, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. It, it's it's two minutes into episode nineteen, and you've already established us as drunks, <laughs> and we are bad parents because it's, we are just pushing everything to Mr. iPad right now. Look, it's nine p.m. and we needed a wine, and we it took a little longer to set up than usual. But I am excited that we're both back. I missed last week. How did it go? Last week, yeah, actually, you were quite missed. I had a couple of messages from people because we had Eric Phillips on last week, and it was a really cool episode. Eric's um, uh, a guy that I really admire and respect, and he was uh, Cass and I's, well, Cass and I's mentor in the lead up to Antarctica. So it was really good to have a chat to him, get him to riff about longevity and what that means to him. But um, yeah, no, people were like commenting afterwards, it's like, "Where's Lauren?" You know, it's like we want to hear from her, and I have to admit, I missed you. So we spend all of our time together. Yeah, I. I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How was your time away from me today? Because you escaped me for a while. Well, you escaped to the big smoke up to Hobart. And what did you do? I know it was crazy. No, I, I I missed the last one because it was Morgan's first day at kindergarten. Well, it was her first introduction to kindergarten, so she gets to go and see what it's like to be a big dolphin, which is the kindergarten class. So I had to miss that with her because we one parent has to take her. But this is great because we're doing an evening one pre-record um, so we can relax and have a wine. And I'm in my Ugg boots. Woo! Can you see that? Okay. <laughs> this is going to get... We feel like we're camming now. We're a cam show. This is, we're going to start an OnlyFans <laughs> well, nice account. around the fire and, you know... Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Having that's a fair. wine and a beer and... Well, well, I think we're just rambling now. We should just jump into it because <laughs> we do have a very exciting guest and we're quite... Um, Ah, we just watched actually his documentary last night. He looks uh, like Clark Kent. He looks like Clark Kent. Can anyone guess Superman. who it is? We've talked about who it is on social media already, so you do know. <laughs> but it's none other than Michael Atkinson, and he is super exciting. He's in. He's a multi award winning adventure filmmaker, and he's gone on this massive, extreme, epic adventure, and he's filmed it called Surviving the Outback, um, that I am blown away by, because, like, I, I am a filmmaker myself, and I make these documentaries, I've made three, and another sort of standalone TV special for Nat Geo, and the thing that I find extremely hard is actually capturing the content and doing it all authentically, you know, filming it in situ, going on an expedition, because those things really war against each other. This Nat Geo documentary that we did, you know, we had to lug a camera crew through it, and the real episode would have been filming them to see what happens. But Mike went out into the into the Kimberley, he did an outback trip, and he filmed the whole thing meticulously well himself. I don't think he probably needed to go back and do any retakes. That's actually one of the questions I have. So it was this awesome month plus long expedition up in the Kimberley where he took a, a raft that he'd constructed himself, uh, replicating a, a a journey that these two German aviators went through uh, 85, years 85 years ago, actually from 2017, I should say. 
And uh, yeah, well, we'll jump into it in a second because with this awesome clip. But beyond that, he's not just a filmmaker. Before filmmaker, he was uh, he backpacked and hiked and climbed around the world. He's a scientist. That's why I like him. I want to jump into that because I am also a scientist. He's ski instructed. He was a survival instructor. And he also happens to be an army helicopter pilot and a Air Force pilot as well. So, tad of an overachiever. Um, my brother also is a, uh, a chopper pilot, so no doubt out they probably actually have circles that know each other um now michael's skills and experience have always motivated uh motivated by the childhood idea that he would one day create adventure films that would capture the true essence of the extreme outdoors with the goal of celebrating and preserving it so before we bring mike in we are going to watch a little video which is a two minute intro to his most recent documentary surviving the outback This is just absolutely spectacular. Oh, I got a fish. I'm gonna get the pole out in case he comes for me. Oh, he's gonna rip me straight off that raft, mate. G'day. My name's Mike. I'm in the remote Kimberley region of Northwest Australia. Up here, the distances are big. The lizards are big. Even the mice are taking steroids. G'day, Skip. I'm out here completely alone. I've got no food, no water, and the nearest help is hundreds of kilometers away. What on earth am I doing here? That's the same question that two German aviators asked themselves 85 years ago when they ran out of fuel here in their seaplane. They tried their best to survive their own way out, but after five weeks gave up and luckily were rescued on the brink of death by local Aboriginal people. I've always been interested in this story, even as a little kid. So I've wondered, if I was in that situation, could I have survived? So with all the survival skills I've learned up to this point in my life as a pilot, survival instructor and adventurer, I want to put them to the test and see if I can make it out with the same conditions that these guys had. How cool is that, Mike? Welcome to the show. So stoked to have you. Good day. Great. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Dude, seriously, uh, that documentary, I absolutely loved it. I really, really did. How the hell did you get all that footage and you're just out there and you're by yourself? I mean, seriously, kudos to you. Amazing. Thanks. Yeah, well, it, it was, um, I mean, I spent a lot of time thinking about it, really. And uh, I thought about all the different scenarios I'd be in and I came up with these little shot lists that might, you know, I should do this if this happens and ended up with, as you know, like probably 50 hours of footage and you squeeze all that down into one hour in the end, which takes about six months to a year to do. Yeah. I mean, that editing process, I actually found more brutal than filming itself and, it's and, it's and, and, and film, filming is hard enough. It really is. And so you did yeah. all that yourself, didn't you? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, all by myself. Well, I was the only one on the expedition anyway. So yeah, there was, there was no other choice. Uh, no, but I'm the shots beforehand and everything I did. The edit as well, though. You did the edit, didn't you? Yep, I did the edit. Yep. So uh, I was actually in Saudi Arabia when I did the edit. In fact, one of the difficult things about that, which made it twice as difficult, was I was living in Saudi Arabia when I launched the expedition. So I only had uh, I had six weeks off, which is the which is over Ramadan, and I had to fly to Darwin Airport and then get in a small little plane. We've only got like a twenty kilo luggage allowance, so everything had to either arrive in mail at this guy's house in Wyndham who was very generous in letting me use his place as an address. So all my drones and all that kind of stuff had to come from a place where you're not allowed to have drones and all, all these extra complications. So um, I did all that and then literally jumped on a plane and went back to Saudi. So, so you were, um, you're living yeah. in Saudi. And then Saudi. I was working full time and then just editing it at night. 
So you're, you're living in Saudi and this was your time off. This expedition was your yeah, vacation. Yeah, well, well, because I'd always planned on, on making adventure films mm. and going to Saudi, you earn a lot of money and it's, it's sort of tax-free and uh, it's the kind of thing that can set you up to then pursue something like I'm doing now, which is making them full time. Mm. That was my plan. So I thought I'll, you know, get myself financially set. Um, but then I also should do a, a full run through of everything. So concept, shooting, uh, editing, distribution, everything. Uh, at the time, I didn't even know what distribution was. And I, I didn't even know what the scope of the film, I didn't even know what a film was, the definition of a film. I thought it would probably just go into YouTube. Uh, and then when I got back the footage, I just thought, oh, I don't know, I think I can do more than YouTube and show it to a few people. And they're like, yeah, do something else with that. And then that's sort of morphed into a film. Um, I had to look up the definition of what's a film, what's a movie, you know, what is, what are these definitions? Because I wasn't familiar with the industry. <laughs> but at least I've been through that whole process now. So is that your kids in the background? <laughs> <laughs> like, um, yeah, door. Morgan, what's like up, Morgan? Door. I knew this was going to happen. Oh. Just, just, you're you just too scared to do something. Okay, open the door. Morgan. Okay, hold on, hold on, Morgan. We'll just keep it rolling. This is real life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no Hi. worries. Yeah, I'll check the hat on? over my door handle. You can see it in the background. <laughs> come kids here, come here. Do you, what does the hat stop? Is it kind of like a tie situation where you're like, don't uh, come in? Uh, well, that's a yeah, that's just a standard old Bunnings hat. But I just thought, I don't know. I mean, it's on the wrong side of the door for starters, but it was covering up the door handle and I. I thought about putting something on the outside, but then I thought, no, nah, that's not going to work because then I can't close the door. And... They're just going to think it's a hat rack. planning, though. <laughs> what did she work? She's coming up, actually. She's, oh, uh, she was too scared to come up because she thought the quals would get her. Um, We've had a quals so... issue under the house. If people come don't know on, come are, in, they're come in. in danger. Oh, animal that that's the and... reason why she was after that's a snack. Right. Okay. She's broken into the pantry. Okay. And, and then she's... you need to go to sleep, okay? Okay, come here. Okay, all right, here, enter, sorry, enter, 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 yeah, here. sorry about this outback. Do you want to come and say hi to Mike? Mike and to, of course, oh, this is timing. Come here, come here. Look at this, look at this. Here. Actually, um, should we just switch just to Lauren for a second here? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to drop us out uh, just so everyone Morgan? can see Morgan for a second. This is Mike. Can you say hi? Hi. Oh, wait, hold on, Morgan. <laughs> hold on, Lauren. Here. I'm getting rid of us. Here we go. We're gone. He's in the middle. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Mike, has <laughs> your bed time? When's your bed? Well, her bed is normally at seven thirty or eight, but because we were filming this, we kind of let her watch a show in case Dylan, our youngest, starts crying and we can't hear her because we don't have technology to tell us that. So we're kind of paying her to be a babysitter with TV, which is you know great parenting. Um, but Mike went to the outback, but he did the part with all the crocodiles. What do you think about crocodiles? They can snap. They can snap. Did you get snapped by any crocodiles? No, no, I got some cranky language and looks from them, but no snapping, luckily. He he didn't get snapped by the crocodiles. Okay, are you okay, go Moo. Back? We'll see you later, Moo. Bye, bye. Okay. Okay. If you need to fall asleep on the couch, you can do that. God, I sound like a. Bye, Moo. Bye. bye. Yeah, Love our you. bedtime's eight thirty, but it ends up being nine thirty every time. Oh, it's 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 an interesting. It's we, an interesting one. We were, we were so good with it for a while. We we're like regimented, like seven thirty, bang, she's in. Now the sun doesn't go down, um, and that that makes things a lot harder and we're on as well. Farm time that the days are just merging together, and we we're on quarantine, and everything just kind of the wheels have fallen off a bit. Anyway, this is uh yeah. We- <laughs> This is boring. We we need we need we need we need a babysitter. I think there's no babysitter. There's no daycare or babysitters on the island. We need a better. Sh- we need a sheepdog then. This is our problem. We need a sheepdog. <laughs> we need a sheepdog. <laughs> Anyone? Can someone that. send a sheepdog uh, to <laughs> us that it can actually hurt a child? That'd be great. But anyway, let's jump in because like my, Mike, we've 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 kept you up so for the this theme. one. The yeah. theme for this this I'm week's so chat. Excited. It's, it's super cool because it is gut feel. Now our, there's so much to sort of jump into and to sort of unpack around that but um i don't know how how you how you want to crack this one open do we want to throw to you mike just to let you sort of run into why this theme uh actually first of all why this theme why why did you choose this one over any other theme out there well it's funny because um there was a friend that got me onto your shows and uh it was michelle lee actually and uh i started at num. i saw she was number seven or something i thought i'll go back to the start so I'm working on a project in the backyard and I've been going through them all in order. And you're and, bored. And you ask the people at the end each time, 
you know, or what do you want to, what are they going to speak about? And I thought, I wonder what I'd speak about. So I was actually already thinking about, like, <laughs> if I ever ended up on a show like this, what I'd want to speak about. And then you email me. So um, I thought, oh, okay. And then I actually have been thinking a fair bit in the last sort of six to 12 months about gut feel and what it really is. Because I haven't Googled it or researched it at all, but it seems to have a pretty rep, bad rap as a term. Like the other day, I, I bought some shares or something and, and um, my mate said, oh, what, what did you what's your basic decision on? I said, oh, gut feel. And he goes, well, I shouldn't do that. Um, you know, the share market may, may not be the place for it, but it generally people don't have a high opinion of you making decisions on gut feel. And I wouldn't recommend doing it just on gut feel either, but it, it cues you into what you should be thinking about. So I've just done a bit of thought about what it is and stuff. So I'm going to kick it off. Basically, I don't think anyone in the modern world with an education would agree that gut feel comes from your guts or your intestine. We all know if you thought about it for five seconds, that it comes from your head. And it's basically subconscious thoughts. And you don't know what they are. They're not articulated in your mind. Um, but they, they're they sort of a risk analysis and they cue you onto certain things if you're, if you're willing to know how to listen to them. So that's sort of what I was going to chat about. Mm. So um, I've got a couple of notes over here. That's all right. Um, I might... There's a connotation, I think, with, with gut feel that it's not factual but i think it is so basically your mind is just absorbing all this information that some of it's been given to you when you were a little well even genetically so like if you have sent you got if you got a dog yeah yeah and if, it, if your dog's never seen a snake and it smells a uh, a snake skin the first time it starts getting really worried and stuff because it's never seen one but it's um it subconsciously is being told by its brain hey you know they get the hackles go up um they they start reacting to it so i think some of it's genetic but a lot of it is learned and as you gather experiences through your life your gut feel learns what's dangerous and what's not and it feeds you information and whether you choose to act on that information is up to you so one of the times um gut feel really got me out of a bind was i was backcountry skiing uh, just a day trip in the snowies just up over carruthers peak i think we went three bow up over carruthers peak and out to um, Gaffiga with a guy that was a little bit less experienced than me and because we didn't have overnight gear it's always risky getting up high uh, if a whiteout hits and I knew that there was some potential for some cloud to come in and we went over Carruthers Peak basically got hit by a whiteout comes in really really quick and we descended down this gully which I was familiar with I'd seen it um, when there was no snow and we're skiing down very steep really steep sides um, and I just couldn't see anything. You know those whiteouts where you just fall over because you can't even balance because mm. you can't mm. see anything? It was one of those ones. So no visual um, cues to help me out. And I just had this feeling that I had to stop and that there was a drop in front of me. Or there was just something not right. So I just stopped uh, and the guy, there was snow plowing down behind me and then he went into the back of me. And I said, oh, we just, oh no, just got to stop for a sec. Something's not right. I don't know what it is. And he was like, oh, I think it's all good. Let's keep going. We we're just chatting, chatting, and probably 30 seconds later, the, the whiteout just lifted enough to see that there was this big drop off, you know, probably only maybe 10 meters or something. It would have you know, busted a leg. Probably may, may not have died, but it would have been pretty ugly. Yeah. And uh, ended up then just get skirting around it. And it took me a long time to figure out what had cued me onto the danger. And I reckon it was probably years or maybe even a decade later. And I'm just replaying my mind what my senses were getting and the vision never changes it was just white white out white out but then i i did recall the sound and there was a a change in the sound and i reckon what it was is we were making noise as we skied down it was reflecting off all around us but then when we got to the edge of this drop off the mm. there was no noise being reflected back towards us because it was just open space and that's probably what cued my mind to stop um and had i not had that listen to my gut then I would have skied off the edge of the thing. So there's that, that's time it definitely saved me. Um, there's been other situations where, um, you know, with a, with a dingo in the snowy mountains, um, I was up by myself and uh, had a bit of a funny situation with a dingo, but his, its body language, I, I never thought dingoes were a threat. I'd always been you know, mm. told they're, they're all fine and if you're dominant, they, they never cause a problem. But this, uh, this dingo did cause me a problem and it was my gut feel which cued me onto the... The danger it didn't actually matter in the end it had to go at me anyway um, it didn't actually latch onto me but it did charge me and i went Ugh! like to try and scare it away 
and then it came really really close to me but once again gut feel was was giving me the cues mm. um another time i was skiing across iceland solo and there's horrendous sort of weather which was cued by things that you don't necessarily formulate in your mind you know the weather's going to be bad but in hindsight i reckon the sky was darker um and that's what's giving you the cue that the bad weather's coming so um it gives you cues basically and it's whether you choose to listen to them and how much um I don't know, gravity you place on your gut feel so um i don't know if you know like you're talking about science there did you do biology at all jamesy no i did a um i did a uh physiology degree actually okay cool i, I don't know if they ever came up with the example of the crocodile brain yes is, yeah yeah when, definitely yeah okay cool so basically when animals evolved they started out in fairly basic terms with this with a brain that probably didn't have conscious internal monologue like we as humans have mm. but it sucked in information and helped it make decisions and well it didn't make decisions it just told it what to do so it sort of act on gut feel and we've now evolved the rest of our brains to be able to have conscious thought and an internal monologue where we actually talk, think in words so i reckon gut feel is that really instinctive brain um that's still left quite usefully in our brain um but just below the the conscious level so um, tapping into that is really, really helpful. Um, so sometimes where you don't need to listen to it, like when you go abseiling, you know, your gut says don't abseil off this cliff because it seems really dangerous. But then when you analyze it and you go, okay, I've got a rope, um, I've checked the knot, I know it's all safe. So I don't always listen to my gut when it tells me not to do something, but if I've analyzed the risks with my subconscious brain, I can override it. But, um, you know, and other times you want to ignore, you could ignore it. Um, you know, if you just go off it all the time, it can end up being a little bit impulsive uh, as well. But, um, and your gut feel won't talk to you if you're a bit arrogant or complacent, depending what mindset you're in. So it won't all, always give you the information that you need. But uh, I just tend to listen to it and I uh, think it's a very useful thing which, which gets me out of sicky situations. Have you been, is, sorry. I'm going to be, I'm going to be controversial because I think it's, it's God, really here we go. interesting that, um, when you started talking that the gut feel is you're like, you know, we all know that it's not in the gut, it's in the head. And I've spent a lot of time and I, I, I don't have the answer to this, but intellectually I always listen to the thoughts in my head. We have a child coming again. So if I'm distracted, it's not because of you. Okay. You can take one more Morgan, cookie and then that's it. Seriously, Morgan, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Oh my God. Um, she came in saying she wanted a cuddle and she came in stole some chips and left and there's a crocodile yeah there's a crocodile brain that you were talking about but i struggle with the monkey brain because i actually it was very intellectual and it was all about if i gave anything of value it would be the thoughts in my brain yet all of a sudden then the thoughts in your brain are jumping all around. And in yoga, they call it the monkey brain, where you're actually trying to quiet the monkey brain from darting around because our brains are oftentimes thinking of a million different things that are not relevant. And it's a practice where you have to drop into your center and your body wisdom. And for me, it's been a process of listening to the body wisdom when your head's overriding. So it's interesting to hear that you really analyze gut feeling from your senses and it's all head based do you have you thought about kind of that head heart gut knowledge base or do you really uh, function I, I would, from the head? i would just go off the purely well my scientific assumption would be that the only place that that kind of thought can happen is in your brain like i don't think there's like you know I'll, my opinion is this you can't think with your, any other part of your body than your brain um, you know, your spinal cord's got a bit of brain in it, but, but, but what about again, that that's... feeling in your gut? You know, like in your, do you have that feeling in your gut? Like the, you just know, like most of the things I've done do not make sense in my head, but there was a gut feeling like, because this was a question I had for you where you were looking at kind of that gut feeling and it's, it's that decision in the moment, right? It's the decision in the moment yeah. of, am I going to stop? What's going on? That that dingo's dangerous, you know, which I've kind of yeah. heard that they're not. But there's so th there's that moment. But then there's also the thing that leads you to be out there in the first place. 
Like, and, and I find that there's, I, I, I'm interested in what it is that goes against rationality to do that. Because a lot of our thoughts would not put us in those places if we listen to them. Yeah, well, I know what you mean. Um, yeah, I mean, your decision to be out there is something that you've already made. and It's sort of too late when you're out there anyway. But I mean, I just find... But what led you? Was it your if... brain or your... Do you ever have a oh. body sensation that's like, I just need to do this? Or do you really make all your decisions in mm. your head? Uh, I don't have a feeling in any other parts of my body. So like, I don't generally... I love this. I love, the, I lo I love this debate. From other parts of my body. Nothing. You know what I mean? Like I've, I've never felt like my, my stomach is actually telling me to do something or I don't feel like my, you know, my love for other humans or animals or anything lies in my heart. I just think it's a different part of my brain. That's all that stuff lives in. Interesting. Um, but I, I mean, I, I just, in that case, there's, there's nothing to be... Uh, in that skiing example, I can just stop and then think about it. You know, I don't have to decide straight away. I just take on that that cue that it's giving me to look out for stuff. And it's very rational. It seem you seem to be a very rational. You're like, okay, well, it's yeah. black. Like here, here's the here's the information I'm getting, and how am I yeah. going to process it? I, I think with his yes. career choice, he has to be like that. I think and this is why I'm I'm, I'm loving this, yeah. and I'm, I feel like I want to be in the middle slot right now because like it's this <laughs> debate and it's like tennis. Because Lauren's, you know, I'm not going to say you're touchy feely because you there's people way more down that scale. But Lauren's very much, you know believes in sort of like you know intuition and that's the right feel and trust your gut and then there's there's yourself like where your your decisions you're making it's high level processing in your brain being a pilot you know it's high speed yeah. processing that's happening um and so you having to have a very sort of rational framework um and all these sub cues you're probably picking up on like the change in timbre of the sound not echoing mm -hmm. back at you um but it, it's 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 funny. Do you what do you believe about luck then? Um, I don't think it's pure probability. Oh, I love it. I, I love it. Word luck. Yes, it's, so it's just interchangeable with yeah with the word probability. Yeah. So if someone says good luck, they could just say hey, good probability. Good good probability. Okay, we should love? start doing yeah. that. Good stats. Oh. <laughs> what do you think about love? Oh, here we go. Here we go. Was love a feeling that was fully in your head, or did you feel it in your body? Oh, in in the head, like I mean, I don't, uh, I don't associate it with any other part of my body. Love. No. I, I can think of one no. other part. Really? <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. I, know. I'm not going I had there. to I'm do that. Going like waist up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it all, it's all, it's all. So for you, it really is that rational. rational thought. But I mean, there's, I mean, there's an evolutionary um, need for love. You know, like loves. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you just want to go purely back to the animal kind of thing, there's a reason that you have love because if, if a mother chicken loves its baby chickens, it's going to stand over them and defend it from an eagle that's trying to kill it. The same yeah. way that if um, some guy came to kill the kids in the street, you'd do exactly the same thing. So, that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it amazes me when you see these um, studies on the news that go, oh, scientists believes that dogs actually have feelings it's like well, duh, of course they got feelings you know like even chickens i mean there's lots of animals that must have feelings um and because there's an evolution it, it's one of those things that binds us together um allows us to look after our young and have more and that's basically, basically natural selection so there's a very strong evolutionary argument for all these things but they, they in life as well and i'm sure animals share the same enjoyment Sorry, you just dropped out for a second, so I'm just letting the the, the connection stabilize again. Um, you there? Just making sure. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, have you ever done anything that's not rational? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I could probably have a, a, a rational explanation for it afterwards, but um, yeah, I mean, I yeah, not as much now as probably when I was slightly younger but I'll, I'll still do random stuff and if you were if you were i'm just trying to pull this thread if you did those irrational things what was leading you to do that when you were younger uh experimentation uh, you know finding yourself and they're all there's a good evolutionary reason 
for those as well. So it's nothing to be ashamed of. Hmm. And just sort of relaxing a little bit, you know, it's, it's good to do that even now, you know, as long as you don't make too much of an idiot of yourself or, or hurt anybody is the most important thing. Because the, the times when I do irrational things are sometimes like I find when we decided to walk across the outback with a child was very irrational for me. Like there was no conscious rational purpose that aligned with career or yeah. path or and it's funny because I people asked us a lot why would you do these things or why did you do that and I don't have a very good answer other than it was a gut feeling so it's an interesting well, that, one it, well and I think your gut feeling was correct and and you and I'd be fair to say that you're really glad that you did that experience C completely but that's where I'm 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 loving understanding your headspace because for me if i look at it physiologically my brain was telling me not to go yeah. my chest was excited and nervous which as i've evolved as i've gotten older i realize that that's usually a good sign like i don't know if i'm nervous or excited but that's usually yeah. a good place to be because it means i'm pushing myself and then my yeah. gut which i i have a very strong feeling in my stomach was calm and I always know if that's the case, it's okay. But my head was freaking out. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So well, yeah, to me, they, they still come from the same place. I, I think I, I get what you mean now. I mean, I mean, I lie awake at night, particularly you know, in the in night or early morning, really worrying about the risks, <laughs> like I'm going to get eaten by a crocodile, I'm going to get drowned in, you know, what, what, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then um, it, you're just more vulnerable to the emotion. And then particularly later on in the day after lunch, you start, you know, being much more rational. Oh, yeah. And by, by the night time, you're sort of like, yeah, let's go and do twice as far, you know. Um, so I definitely have those feelings and I'm constantly analyzing those. And I think any adventurer mm. has mm. to do that, you know. I mean, you must have seen Solo, um, yeah. Andrew McCauley's film. Yeah. I mean, every adventurer has to watch that. Um, and it's a kind of thing. It's true. You know, that it, it's a really important film that, that was made there because things can go wrong. You know, when you when you roll the dice, sometimes they come up showing the numbers you don't want to see. Well, it's interesting um, but, that you raise him because that movie struck me the most. Um, and I think about it a lot because he left his wife and kids and, and he had small children. And kids he was, singular. One. Was he just one? Yeah, Finlay. And he was crying as he was paddling out and and yeah. before i did an expedition i'm like why is he going like he ought, there's something telling him not to go why is he overriding that yeah yep it's funny if he hadn't been stopped by the police uh that first time yeah he knows yeah what would, what would have happened the, the roll of the dice on because he actually that he turned around because he was caught on that one um, yeah yeah, so I mean, you you should be facing that every time I, I do a new expedition or take any risk. I always think, okay, so I die. What am I going to think to myself? You know, my next expedition on on the Barrier Reef when this dugout canoe was going to be like fifteen hundred k's and I'm going to bush tucker the whole time. It's going to be pretty dicey. And I always think to myself, okay, if I find myself in the water getting swamped at night, about to drown, what will be running through my head? You know, and I don't want it to be anger at myself for taking stupid risks. So I keep going back to myself and thinking, okay, how am I going to mitigate those risks? Right, I'm going to have to not commit to bad weather. What does that mean? I'm going to have to sit out and starve for longer for maybe weeks on end with, with, you know, in a really compromised position. But that's better than ending up in the water or about to drown, you know. So, so you're always running through scenarios to help uh, you. Always, yeah. always running through scenarios, yeah. And this is interesting because this is why, like, I think where Laura and I clash a little bit and we had our biggest fight in the outback because I, I have a tendency that I, I crunch the numbers. I crunch the numbers and look at, yeah, it's probability. It's like, all right, cool. We're walking across the outback. Yes, granted, we're on trails and stuff like that. So, we're, we're not too far away if we need to get, you know, picked up or anything like that. But the shorter amount of time that we're actually out there, you're, you're decreasing the probability that a negative event's going to happen. Um, and, and so, I'm constantly crushing crunching those numbers so constantly thinking about how to minimize the time out there so i'm trying to push faster and harder and get better and more yeah, efficient okay. yeah. and 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 lauren was more about wanting to go through the experience and feel you know stop at the stations and check out that water hole and do things like that the, the enjoyable things <laughs> that for me were like i was on vacation these aren't these aren't mission critical you know we've, we've got to stick yeah. to stick to what we've got to do um yeah. so we had a massive clash about that and then we realized that we 
we needed to uh, clear the air and actually come up with like, I suppose this is what we're doing and, 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 and the goals have to be aligned. Otherwise you're going to have that friction. Um, well, I think my brain doesn't work like that. It's interesting. Cause I never, I, when I met Justin, I didn't understand why people did this stuff. Like, why would you go to Antarctica and freeze for 89 days and starve yourself? Like life is hard enough already. Why, why do this? Why go to the Kimberleys? Actually, the Kimberleys I can see a bit more because it's a beautiful, beautiful, stunning place. And I would like to be in a place like that in nature. So for me, I guess that, you know, drive is for that beauty. However, to yeah. see if I could survive in that element, I don't, there hasn't been that pull for me yet. It is a very inbuilt thing for Justin. So it's been funny to watch kind of what it is and what drives us are two very different things um, in yeah, adventure. Yeah. And we had to come to terms of, you know, like what it is. And so when you went out there, you, in your documentary, which we just watched, which is amazing, um, it's called Surviving the Outback. And are we, can we share that with the audience or how do they watch look at it? it, look at it. Nothing's free, Lauren. Come on, well, jeez. I mean, share, Guys gotta get paid. share a link, yeah, to, to rent it or uh, how do they well, watch it? Well, you can it? go to my website. Uh, yeah, you can, uh, outbackmike.com.au, uh, you, can, you can buy there. <laughs> Perfect. Good. There we go. Well, well, it's, it's worth seeing for a variety of reasons. There but you go. The, the, the beauty is amazing, but the story is really cool. So you, you tell the story that you had followed these two aviators who downed their plane 85 years before, and it was something that you were curious about as a child. And that's yeah, what drove okay. you out there. Is that... Yeah, that, in a nutshell, that, that's right. Yep. So um, they, yeah, basically, I, I didn't reenact what they did. I just reenacted what they started with. Mm. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I'm using my skills and experience, which they didn't have. So that's why I keep saying, like, it's not like I'm trying to say they did a bad job. I reckon they did an awesome job. Yeah. But just with my skills and experience, can I, how would I get out? So I just came up with my own, own ways of doing it. So. I'm only reenacting the start point and then I go from there. I could try and do a reenactment, but then I'd have to sort of just starve myself stupid and it wouldn't be realistic because there'd be no one you'd need to starve with. And um, you, you, you know what the end is going to be and therefore this it's not as exciting, I don't think. But what was it What was it that really drew you to want to do that? Well, um, other, I mean, like you said, the Kimberley is really beautiful and I'd always look for excuses to go there. But uh, I did want to tell stories and, and I keep asking myself, why do I want to tell stories? Um, mm. And it sort of comes back to two childhood dreams. Um, one was I watched Top Gun and thought that was cool. Um, and then the other one was I watched the Bush Tucker Man and I, I loved that as well. So um, whilst I, what I do is not necessarily Bush Tucker, like a, a lot of it's based on Bush Tucker, I sort of really stick myself in the situation. So when I was figuring out how, to, how do I make films and do this, childhood dream of making films i just researched survival stories in the kimberley all around australia and that that one came up and i went oh, that's right that's the one that i saw my kid and my parents watching when i was a nine or whatever it was uh and then and it's an amazing story and uh yeah it just sort of a thought process evolved into yeah maybe i could do that um, and that's now sort of becoming the formula which i'm taking forward to this next one which is a shipwreck survival which is just it's even more amazing story um, yeah, so can you share of... what the next one is? Yeah, sure. So this um, this shipwreck survivor called James Morrow. I've got a mm. book here. This, um, I, I read this book basically um, by this guy. I'm just going to put, put your solo. It. Hold on one second. There we go. Um, yeah, so this shipwreck yeah. survivor, 1846, uh, wrecked outside the Barrier Reef. They made a raft uh, at the, as the ship was breaking apart and 21 or 25 of them st started this raft journey ashore and uh, only seven of them made it. Like They were just dying, dropping like flies, especially after, um, you know, they were getting eaten by sharks and all sorts of crazy, crazy things. But they got ashore uh, and then they came across local Aboriginal people who just looked after them. Um, and basically, six more of them ended up dying just um, through the ordeal. And this one guy was left over and lived with him for 17 years until uh, the wave of white people sort of passed through Queensland and he re-assimilated. But he <laughs> was fully assimilated into a society. Um, you know, he 
became like the possum catcher for the tribe. It was really good with mechanical things. Uh, he, they both respected each other. And uh, he wrote a, basically a very short book about his experiences. And then he died sort of two years after reassimilating. So I'm just putting myself in the same spot with the same materials that he had. He's, you know, he went on a raft. The captain chucked their charts and logs on, and those charts and logs would have been basically based on what Captain Cook had um, gathered. Mm. And so I'm just going to start with those materials and say, if he had wanted to get out, and um, you know, there, I researched and found that Captain Bly had put a, a safe haven in Cape York for, re for shipwrecked sailors, and he Bly had actually sailed past it himself when he was mutinied. Um, and he probably thought to himself, oh, we really need to put a haven here. So that was in place. He probably would have known about it. So I'm just... Could you make yourself there? Basically yeah. an excuse for an adventure and building a canoe and sailing up to Cape York. Uh, either that or you have to stay out there for 17 years. And I, 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 that'd be funny for family <laughs> life. How would that go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Obviously, I re what he did is what I would actually do. It'd be an awesome experience if you didn't have a family to live with Aboriginal people. Oh, it'd be unbelievable. But uh, yeah, this will be a, a pretty cool experience in itself. Are you taking the family or is this going to be another solo? No, no, no. And, and like survival is a really, really uncomfortable thing yeah. to, to put up with. I mean, it was really uncomfortable being in the Kimberley. If, if, you know, when I did survival exercises in the military and you basically don't need anything for 10 days, you just you, you sort of hate every moment, really. Um, although because I know, you know, when you're tracking through Antarctica, pulling a 200 kilo sled, you, you're hating almost every moment. You know, a couple of little happy moments here and there, but when you get back, you forget about all the the memories fade really quickly of the hardship. Um, is, it, the is that type two or type three fun? Type two, type that's type two fun, isn't it? Type three is where you don't remember the highs. It's just more well, oh, the growth. There's types of fun. Yeah, I think there's 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 so oh, someone can probably correct us later on, but there's like three types of fun. There's type type one, type two, type three fun. Um, and type one is it's fun when you're doing it. It's fun. Yeah. You know, type two is it's not fun when you're doing it, but it's fun afterwards. And type three, yeah. it's not fun in reflection, but there's a lot of growth from it. And I'm like, well, is that really fun? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, right. there's yeah, a lot, of, a lot of that. Two or three, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Those were always the types that I, of fun that I did not understand before. <laughs> before. And, and as you know, too, with filming, like it's no fun filming. Like, no. It, you've got to be so focused on what you're doing. You couldn't sit down and have family time at the end of the day. You'd be like, oh, I've got to get a time lapse of the sunset and I've got to oh. get close up at the campfire. You know, so, so, so I, I try not to film much when the family's around. So that was one of my gripes of actually doing the Outback trip is that, that we, we wanted to make a documentary about it as well. And we did and, it, and, it's, and it's great, but just like it, 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 was a, it was a war like trying to get those shots and you're like get to the end of the day and excuse my French be like fuck I'm just too tired you know I've yeah, I just, yeah. I just I, I've been dealing with you know the, the physical side of the journey and then you got to deal with the child and yeah. when you're dealing with something as, as rational as a child a 15 month old on an expedition it's just like I'm so ground down what's the bare minimum I can do at times and you have to kind of drag yourself out there um, whereas when you're, you're filming by yourself at least you know the only one you're really impacting is yourself exactly. um, yeah. yeah and you can be more selfish about it I suppose but I thought that was amazing yeah, yeah. how you you're doing these kind of traditional journeys yet you're breaking the third wall and modernizing it and I thought that was really well interesting in two ways where you talk about modern and traditional a lot and kind of I don't know how to ask this, but there was a, you have a beautiful kind of, it seems that you're drawn to nature and traditional, but have this beautiful way to bring a modern lens to it, but then appreciate the traditional. So the indigenous culture, um, you know, um, untouched nature, um, minimalistic travel. Is that a conscious, like, are you aware that this is kind of something that you're always playing between or is it something yeah, that you yeah, just I'm do naturally? Yeah, I'm actually developing that more and more. So, yeah. I mean, I always consider myself someone, well, I'm, def I'm not Aboriginal at all. Um, I'm part Indian, like a very small, like 4% or something. So a lot of people actually think I'm Aboriginal. <laughs> the other, last week I went to the doctor to get a mole looked at and uh, he actually said, mate, are you an effing Aboriginal? No, no, he said, are you an effing abo, actually? Hmm. Which I thought was actually, that so, no so, one uses what? that word anymore, and they, and they actually shouldn't use that word anymore. No. Yeah, so I actually didn't know whether to be complimented because if someone 
call me Aboriginal, I'm, I'd be proud of it. But then I knew that it probably wasn't being told in in flattering terms. But anyway, <laughs> um, but I basically have always thought Aboriginal culture is just awesome. Mm. Um, and I think it's because I just love the bush and I just instantly see their, their connection to it and, you know, all the same connection. Um, mm. I don't probably don't feel as much as they do um, because they are really into time with it. But, Initially, my interest in Aboriginal culture was about the bush tucker and the survival and all that kind of stuff. As I've, um, through this documentary process as well, and I've widened my research a lot, I'm starting to um, come to the conclusion that the, the best thing that we need to learn out of it is how to manage the landscape again with um, traditional fire. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, the landscape, stepping back as well, before that respect for Aboriginal culture. I remember walking through so many parts of Australia and looking at the bush and thinking, it's just not quite right. You, you can barely walk, walk through the bush in a lot of parts of Australia because there's so much undergrowth. Mm. Um, there's no grass on the ground. So you're like, okay, what are, what are the kangaroos supposed to eat around here? And basically the landscape didn't used to look like that. Like say, look at the Royal National Park, for example, that's not what it looked like um, before. And even Captain Cook wrote about what it used to look like. He said it was um, sparse trees with heaps of grass underneath almost like someone had manicured it he wrote it mm. in, his, in his journals and stuff and i went back to botany bay and filmed it and now you can you know you can barely walk anywhere um when he landed up in uh cooktown because he hit a reef he called this hill grassy hill and uh the artist made an engraving of it and drew it it was covered in grass with a few lines of trees in it and i went back and shot it the other day and it's um covered in basically jungle so it didn't used to look like that. The landscape used to be completely different because it was being managed all the time in a very specific and skilled way by Aboriginal people. So, you know, the answer... I don't like saying the answer to the bushfires, the last bushfire crisis is Aboriginal um, or traditional burning because hazard reduction is only a small part of traditional burning. It, it really is about optimising the, the, the landscape for plants and animals. Um, and it's just a, it just happens to be a bonus 10% that it stops horrendous bushfires. So, yeah, my respect for Aboriginal culture is growing, but it's also unlocking these things that can really help us out now. Mm. Right. I, think that's, I think that's a really interesting thing. What else have you learned kind of from a traditional lens that you wish more people in the modern day world either knew or appreciated or... I don't um, think people appreciate enough the Aboriginal culture and how how it works to maintain sustainability. And that's a boring word. People get yeah, sick of hearing that word, sustainability. And I'll, there's an assumption that people have that Aboriginal people weren't advanced enough to be able to exploit the resources to the point where they were unsustainable. Mm. But that's not true. They you can in the, that uh, those window pane shells I was eating in the, in the documentary there. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I've been there for a week. By the end of the week, I'd eaten all of the shells out of that area. So they, and that was just me, like, so a whole tribe, you know, fairly sparse and, you know, country like Australia has to learn how to manage resources. So for them, it wasn't just about, um, okay, let's just have a rule that you have to stop when you, before you eat all the resources. It was intertwined in their spirituality, mm -hmm. um, their laws, um, their values, so all of the parts of their society were based around um, in looking after the environment mm. and taboos. If you were to to, um, to break it, they'd have like they like a totem, and a, I don't know if that's the right word, but a person yeah. in the tribe would be the totem of the koala, um, and the they moiti. would specifically look out for the koala yeah. and defend that 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 uh, animal. So it's uh, it's done in a really good way. So it'd be like if, imagine if we're all you yeah, have a Christian background, effectively in Western culture. If the Catholic Church had a rule that you must not uh, land clear more than ninety percent, you know we'd probably obey it, and that's effectively what they had. It, so all parts of their society um, came back to not uh, over exploiting the landscape. So we should we could actually look at how they did that and go right. Oh, we need to put more in the laws, you know, increase the values for kids at school, you know, just look analyze how they did stuff so we can stop doing what we're doing at the moment. I think that that's what I appreciated the most about your documentary, The Surviving the Outback, is the credit that you gave um, to indigenous culture. Um, 
I, I love hearing about the land care. I, I work in sustainability, so you're preaching to the converted, but I do, I am aware that people are over it in many ways. But then again, you're like, well, this is your planet. And, you know, without it, what do we have? So it, it baffles me that it's not a high priority. And I love kind of from an indigenous point of view that they it's not an other, you know, like we're like, oh, well, that's out there. Versus they're like, it's in my blood. It, it My land yeah. is within me. And it's I love it like I love my kids. Like what you're t- saying, you know, like we have this bond and love is ultimately to help us survive or help our kids survive. Well, you know, we've somehow lost that to the native world in many ways. And I think, yeah. you know, rediscovering that and honoring that um, as a part of adventure is... For me, it's an intuitive connection, but you don't always see it in adventure films. And I think the fact that you not only honored it, but showed it and embody it is something that is really unique and wonderful. And I really appreciated seeing it in many levels. And I look forward to kind of seeing you explore it further. Oh, thanks. Hey, can I just, while we're chatting on that, can I just give a plug to this guy here? Sure. An uh, Aboriginal guy called Victor Stephenson. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'll make the full screen. Hold up. Okay, cool. Yeah. So he just published his book. It's um, I'm trying to hold right away. There we go. Yeah, it's good. Uh, and it's it's an excellent book about uh, how traditional burning works. And this, I know that your audience is probably mostly adventurers, and that therefore they've walked all over Australia more than anybody else. So if you're an Aussie adventurer, you admit you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't read that book. It'll help you understand uh, why things are different. That's really, no, really no. Well done. I definitely have to check that out. I'm like, I'm very curious about that. I had some minor experience with, I suppose, a uh, a group up in um, Northeast Arnhem, Arnhem Land up at Maparu and spent a couple of weeks up there living with them. So, not even scratch the surface. But um, yeah, just I remember us being on the coast and they were kind of teaching us how to, how to, how to basically hunt and do that bit of collecting and so that sort of stuff. And uh, it, all of a sudden, we're like on this beach up there and like the headlands on fire, just burning. And we're like, whoa, what the happened, you know? And the, and this guy that kind of adopted me, he was my wawa, my brother, comes over and he's like, and I was like, what happened? He's just like, you know, he's like, oh, no, I, I, set, it, I set it on fire. And I was like, I was thinking like, oh, this guy's just a pyro or something like that. And he's like, and I was like, what's, what's the thought pattern? And he found it really hard to explain because he didn't have much English and I don't speak Yolnu uh, Mata. Um and he was just like, it's, it's, it's kind of like our way of showing this is, this is our land and we're, we're managing it. It's ours. And, and, and it's, 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 it's been taken care of. Um, and I, I, I never was able to sort of get it fully out, but I think there was something more to that. There was more to the, the, where, where this is our land because we're managing it. It's not just showing that, you know, like a, a white person might where, you know, I drive a flash car, I'm a big player. It's not that it's, we're managing it. We're taking care of it. That's why, that's why we're doing this. Um, and I wish I could go back there and actually try and dive into that a bit more. So that Victor book sounds fascinating. Yeah, it's good. In, in my film, you would have seen occasional bit mm. of smoke on the horizon. There's a lot of fire that happens. A lot of fire up up well, there. That stuff there is actually was is done by Aboriginal people, but it's they're doing um, they're dropping it out of helicopters. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, and there is some controversy about the methods they're done. And there's a program that the government does where they basically pay aboriginal people to burn because uh, because it gets some carbon credits mm. um so you can buy carbon credits effectively through the government off the aboriginal communities um but it's a bit of a complicated process but it almost encourages them to burn more yeah um, okay and and burn later in the season in order to meet western statistical sort of you know kpis and stuff like that so it's a complex process, but anyway, the big picture is I read that book and he, he does a much better job of explaining it than I do. Well, I think, and I think it's the traditional knowledge is, I mean, it goes back to that gut feeling. There's a lot of honed knowledge that I believe is learned through gender. I mean, indigenous people are storytellers, right? And so you go out and you spend time and you, it's a, it's a verbal language that you share and, and send it down. But I do think too, there, I remember when we were in, um, an indigenous community, they were like, look, Western culture, you come in and you prove that you're worth something because you do something. So in the Western world, I do something to show you that I'm worthy. And then you might want to get to know me. Versus in indigenous culture, it's very much we sit here and we are beings together 
And once I sense you and you sense me and we connect, then we can get on with doing. Yeah. Yeah. They're certainly, they're not as into the upfront straight down a business like Western culture is. Yeah. It, there's, the Saudis are similar to that as well. Uh, mm. there's, it's very rigid. It's bust in and start talking business. You sort of mm. like, hey, what's important is our connection. And by the way, maybe we should do some businesses. That's, yeah. And I would say for yep. me, it's that intuitive connection, you know, like it goes back to that gut feeling, which was the, the, is it head? Is it heart? Um, yeah. and for me, I've always had this saying where it's like, um, head, heart, stomach. And I kind of check that line. Um, but it's hard because I always kind of drove off of this head. So it, it's, it's, it's something that I've, I've really played with about how do we not devalue that emotional side or that intuitive side or that traditional side and go into that western kind of dominating yeah, what, yeah. side you know yeah, like it where is. it's it's very like rigid and i don't know do you play with those two things given what you've done i mean you've been in the army you've been in the military yeah you've lived in saudi arabia you've done survival training which is probably the most alpha male can am i wrong like it's very mm, or is yeah there a That'd be the perception that the TV has. Like there's yeah. that thing, you know, that big grills, SAS Australia kind of thing where, yeah. but it's really not. Um, that's what I, because the Aboriginal, the survival instruction I did was uh, a predominantly Aboriginal unit called Norforce. Mm. Really? Um, been running since World War Two, And it's basically, it's Aboriginal people giving their knowledge and um, it being handed back. So. And that's a, the program not, that happens now. Well, it's been going since 1942. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The generosity of their them sharing their knowledge. I mean, you even mentioned it. You said, um, "What did you say?" The the generosity of spirit. You think that they do it better than anyone? Yeah, they. Uh, yeah, it constantly amazes me uh, if, when you look at how they have been treated. Then you know, Completely. the, the massacres are pretty. There's a lot of really, really bad treatment, but they just continue when you ask nicely and politely to be generous and let you give you permission to do things on their land and, and stuff. And they often they're a bit guarded to start with because they've been, you know, screwed over so many times, whether it's a mining company coming and going, oh, yeah, we're going to do this. And then it ends up being a really bad fit thing for them. Sometimes yeah. it can be a good thing, but from what I've seen, uh, often it's not a good thing at all. So, but they just, yeah, they're just generous, really. Yeah. But also really capable. That's the thing I think that people will miss out on the, how capable they are in the bush. The ones who Absolutely. still have the connection. A lot of them don't have a connection and they were ordered um, not to have the connection. They weren't allowed to speak their language. They weren't allowed to do anything bush. They weren't even allowed to leave the, the missions that they were in without. Um, so they were con basically confined to missions in the Kimberley mm. um, and not allowed to leave. So that they, they were denied the ability to pass on their culture. So that, that's why a lot of them are a bit lost because they, they, they never got it. They, they never got the lessons passed down to them. Yep, in that verbal language. I, I want to pull this back to gut feel for a second because I'm, I, I love the concept of gut feel in, in terms of, in both what you mean and what Lauren means in terms of like that intuition mm -hmm. of feeling in your stomach versus with a high level processing that's going on in your brain. Um, and certainly like we're talking about indigenous Australians are so much more attuned with their mm -hmm. environment. And I think it's, it's that it's an immersion in an environment and, and your, your resonance with it. And I, I know that's, that's kind of what I seek. You know, you, you immerse yourself on a trip, you go out there and, and you live and die by the sword because you make these decisions that have straight away, you have your consequences. Um, Western society, I think, you know, it's crazy to think that everyone living on this planet right now is, their ancestors going back thousands of years have made the right decisions for us to be alive. And it's only, we've only been the past probably two, 300 years in Western civilization where that's actually deviated by society's, um, you know, kind of, I suppose, society and technology sort of defending those that probably would have made bad choices and, and allowing those genes to kind of propagate that we're seeing this, I think, you know, uh, I'm not trying to speak badly, but, um, a bluntening of the sharpness that that you see in in indigenous like communities when they're connected to the to, to the, their environments um the the moiti the moiti i think it's what they call it up in yolnu uh the yolnu region sort of yeah maparu northeast arnhem land is the is the thing you're talking about with the not being able to eat certain meats 
you know they they come up with these rules and structures because they they see things and it's and and they might not necessarily know down the track but there's a reason for it because that it's like no this is what we've always done one person can't eat the kangaroo because that's his totem you know and they have to kind of protect and make sure and, and then there's a certain group within that that the, they just don't do that other people don't eat the emu um and it's just this generational wealth of knowledge um yeah and, and that helps keep mm. those populations that alive and 100%, uh, certain yeah. people are allowed to hunt turtles you know mm. yeah things like that all they all assist with the sustainability basically mm. So, yeah, sorry. Is that where I, you were going? Yeah, no, that I was. Oh, no, yeah, I was. Yeah. I was. I was partially going in there, but I was. I was going with with, with the gut feel. No, hundred percent. I agree with you. I love it. Um, but the the gut feel thing. It's the the three brain system that we touched on before, which is the reptilian crocodile brain, the mammalian brain, which is the limbic brain, uh, the the and then the neocortex, which encases it all. And you need it. So it's, it's almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The yeah, that's the. A great one. The, yeah, the the reptilian brain is what keeps you alive, keeps you safe. It needs you need to you need to make sure you feel secure. And so, when you're in fight and flight, that's where you go. And the next level up there is the limbic, which is the mammalian brain, which is all about emotions. Um, and if you can calm down those emotions and get that stuff out of the way, then you can use your neocortex, which is your thinking brain, which is the brain that has separated us from. Uh, all our previous, you know, Homo sapiens has separated us from all the previous sort of iterations of, of, of hominid. Um, and that's the brain that allows us to have those te- amazing technological advance, uh, advances and stuff like that. But um, the reptilian brain, I think, is hyper interesting because I think there is something innate. Like you said, a dog fears a snake without knowing. And it's just it's just part of them. A cat, if you do the cat and the cucumber trick put a cucumber yeah. behind a cat and it, it will just go ballistic and just run a mile or jump like two feet, five feet what in the air. That? You put a ca- cucumber behind a cat. Any cat. Any cat. Any cat. You put, everyone do this tomorrow. <laughs> if you've got a cat, yeah. put a cucumber behind yeah. your cat and then as yeah. soon as they see it, they will leap and they will just get away from uh, it. I've, I've thought about that one. I wonder whether it's a snake, whether they think it's a snake initially or something. But, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean... We- kids, kids get out of the dark as well is another one. This is humans. Like most kids are scared of the dark. There's a good reason for that because, you know, if we evolved in Africa and there's bloody lions But around, where, no where does that come from? Oh, this is what I want to jump in because like, yeah, we're, we're, cool. kids are afraid of the dark. You know, dogs are afraid of snakes. You know, a kitten. Would that happen cool. if you put a cucumber next to a kitten? Or is that something that comes in later in, in their brain? Um, yeah, well, yeah. It must come in pretty soon, I reckon. Um, I'm going to be like terrorizing cats from now on. This is going to be bad. I At have least a question they're... about emotions though to both of you. Okay. Are emotions good or bad? Good. Uh, is this a trick question? No, because you were just like in one of your brains, you have to get the emotions out of the way so that you can then... If you want to make like, no, no, I, I think emotions are great. Emotions are what drive us, you know. The, you've got survival down the bottom here, which is what the reptilian brain is all about. And then you've got the emotional brain, which is what moves people. That's how you sway an audience. That's how you get groups of people to do something. That's how, you know, you're able to, 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 to create a movement. But... The, the brain, the neocortex just gives that structure and direction to, to that emotion. So do you think when you're in an adventuring, is it important to be able to turn on and off? I think it's definitely really important yeah. to turn off and emotions. And is that something 100%. That you can learn and how? Yeah. Because a lot of people don't have access to that. Like for the people listening at home and are like, I've never done anything extreme, but I would like to, but I'm scared. Ooh, or this is- I'd like to, but I don't know if it's right for me. What advice would you give to them about managing their emotions, their head, their heart, their gut? Yeah, I want to hear your take on this and then I'll, I'll, I'm going to go back with my thoughts. Well, I mean, for someone that, that's thinking about getting into it, you should just take not too small steps because that's boring. Take <laughs> take a, appropriate steps, you know, like, get, you know, go out for five nights. You know. A step big enough to scare like, you. Yeah, and, and then you'll go through that process and you'll go, oh, I didn't handle that well, and then you'll apply it to the next one. So once you've done five adventures, it's in a way, if you push yourself, it becomes old hat and you learn those emotions. So there's a great um, poet saying from someone, it might have been an ex-president or something, I don't know, but it basically goes along the lines of if you're on an expedition and at some stage you don't think, oh, I should never have done this, then you obviously didn't pick something hard enough. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I, the first time I sort of did an expedition, I was 17 and skied from... Mount Kosciuszko to Canberra, we had to walk the last half because obviously there's not enough snow once we get past Brindabellas. But um, 
I remember at the start of that trip, just going, "Oh man, this is the dumbest idea. We should never do this. This is just dumb." And then that's every expedition, isn't it? The next twenty years, I I would experience that, and now I know to expect that, and I know that you know, in the Kimberley, mind you, I didn't think that because I've I just I just know the process. You know, you do an adventure after adventure, and um, you just know where you are in the process, and. Part of the process is getting on an adventure, finding it really scary, really dangerous, really uncomfortable, and wishing you were never there in the first place. Um, you just go, oh, well, there it is. I've got it. Oh, well, just just focus on what I need to do. Because it is, you could see your brain kind of click into that. You know, like even when you had taken your boat and you were about to start your walking journey, you're like, oh, what I did was just amazing, but I can't even think that because... I have the next yeah, you, thing and you're like you have to stay focused and so yeah. that focus is a really important one that um not just adventurers but anyone that does something difficult in a high pressure situation has to be able to stay focused and so understanding what focus is is important i never used to understand what it, what it was and it's being able to just concentrate on the task at hand and not running off going oh what am i doing should i be doing this um so for example i mean i failed my first driving test and in hindsight, I was just really worried about other things. Um, I applied, took me three goes to get in as a military pilot. Uh, the first time I didn't do that well in the in the theory test because I was too focused on, oh man, have I answered this question on time? Oh, is it, you know. So my, fo- my brain wasn't concentrating on doing the maths question. It was worrying about how or well I was doing doing the maths question. The second time um, I passed them, but they raised the pass mark because it was the, um, the second time I'd seen it. Then I went traveling around the world had a backup plan what i was going to do uh, and then the third time i was much more focused and my brain was always capable but i'd learned how to focus it a bit better how so any tips um, on it that one it was just acknowledging it but i've got a super good tip um when i was doing a flying instructor development conference we had a sports psychologist from the us come over who had um he was tiger woods a sports psychologist hmm. something like that and he basically put up a picture of um, Tiger Woods at, at the 18th hole of a really big tournament and there's all these people standing around him and they, he goes what do you think's running through Tiger Woods' his head and you could think to yourself oh okay he's um, he's stressed because he might slice the ball and hit that old lady in the head you might be thinking oh if I don't get you know if I drop a shot on this one I'm going to lose this match and then I'm going to lose my number one ranking he's not thinking that it's natural that he would think those things but because mm-hmm. he, his psychologist has told him hey you're going to think these things so what, what I want you to do as soon as you get a negative thought is um come up with three really important sentences about yourself that you know to be true that will help get you focused again things like yes it's windy and um, i might slice the ball but i've practiced my crosswind game better than anybody else yes this is high pressure but i'm tiger woods and i'm the best guy in the world at handling pressure so i i gave that same example to guys on pilots course when they when they fail missions and they repeatedly fail because i asked them you know like what happened when you descended through this altitude and failed the mission what was running through your mind? And he was mm-hmm. thinking, oh, I was actually wondering whether the mistake that I made half an hour earlier thought he was gonna be the one that failed me on the mission. So he was just not focused on the task at hand. So mm-hmm. I would get him to come up with his three things. So if you're a, an adventurer or someone doing something in a difficult situation and emotions pull you off track and now you're just focusing on, oh, you know, what's my wife gonna think if I die and all that kind of stuff, instead of thinking, what's the weather doing? Is this an avalanche danger period or not? You know, or did I put my skis on properly as I cross this off the slope? So you're losing focus from the emotions. So that's mm. why adventures are good at getting rid of the emotions because they they clog your brain up. Um, I was watching yeah. SAS Australia thing the other night that he said this this British guy when he was in Afghanistan or something. He told his wife, "Don't send me any presents or anything. I don't want to talk because I don't want to lose focus because it helps keep you alive." So um, yeah, focus is important. Mm. Yeah. I want to jump in and give, give my two bobs on, on, on Lauren's question and talk about emotions. But before I do, I just like, once you pass those three those three courses, you then turn into this guy. Sorry, I just got to put this photo up. It's Laurie, Lauren, I'm going to cover your face for a second. Look at that. Oh, seriously. Is that you? Oh, I, know, I know it's taking up the whole screen, but I'm just going to put it there. Um, <laughs> look at that. Look at that. Tom Cruise, eat your heart out. Uh, and that's what a couple of people said. A comments actually came in on Instagram. It's like, it's like, he's like Australia's Tom Cruise right here. It's Australia's Top Gun. Um, look at that. 
<laughs> we'll just leave that up in the corner for a little while. <laughs> but talking about um, um, emotions, no, I, I, I mute. I definitely mute my emotions. Mute, emotions can be a distraction um, on expeditions and trips. And, and it was. You're a, a very emotional oh, person. I'm hyper emotional. I like. I I cry over bloody. You cry more than I do. I do definitely. I mean, you didn't cry through the birth of our children, and, and I did. I blubbed like a baby. But um. I even cried in that Turbo movie where that snail got its shell crushed and no, I started crying. Focus. Okay, sorry. I'm mostly quite angry. And you also have a problem with focusing. So, I don't know how you've survived all these expeditions. Well, okay, th- that's the thing. That's the thing. When you put in a high-pressure situation, and I now know this about myself, when I'm put in a high-pressure situation, um, you know, it's I, I need that catac- you know that adrenaline rush to, to actually calm me down. It's like all of a sudden the light bulbs turn on because it allows me to focus because now there's a reason to focus for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, the emotions are, are, are negative and they need to be muted because they can distract you. So I, I've been told when I went across the Tasman with Cass because I am emotional that out there it was like my normal waves are like this. And I was just kind of like this tiny little flat line. And like the highs weren't even that high. The lows weren't even that low because it's it's a better way to be on a trip. Um, it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can Although, see exactly why you do that. Yeah. It, 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 it's you, Otherwise, that emotional brain can hijack your, your neocortex. But the, I do always think that you should listen to that that reptilian brain. The, the gut brain that is primitive, that is taking in cues from the environment. And we, we I comment about this all the time with Lauren. We'll be in a situation, whether it's in the outback or something, and some and, and you'd be better than me at this because you've got more experience. And then you go with an ind- indigenous bloke and it'd be a, a scale down the road again. But there'd be something just off about, you, it's nighttime, you're sitting in a campfire or you're walking somewhere and you just know, it's like there's something watching us. And the reason you know is not because you know there's, there's you feel the presence of another animal over there. It's because you know the the pitch of the cicadas has changed. You know there's something yeah, there's, yeah. there's something's different. Something's off, and your brain automatically knows which direction it is. Like you can pinpoint it. Now I can do that, and I do it all the time. And Lauren's lost that ability or doesn't have that ability. It's quite interesting because like I've noticed it several times now. Just on the farm, I'd be like, "Oh, there's a qual over there somewhere, or, or, or there's something over yeah. there." Because, and I think that's that shows that the that gut feel is trainable. If, yeah, if Lauren experience had the same experiences you, she probably would start to cue onto it. But you've got or, to be exposed to a lot. Or, or, or if you took you took. Um, this would be an interesting experience if I went actually because you did a lot of stuff actually over in America more than you know me. It's a different environment, different cues. Um, but yeah. if I went over into your environment, I'd probably be lost. If you took a an indigenous Aussie and and dropped him in the in the I don't know um, the jungles of Africa, you know he'd know something's amiss, but he wouldn't be able to place it because he's outside of his his sphere of comfort. What's, what do you guys think about you know like if if there if this is a honed sense, what do you think modern day is doing? to us as humans in you know the nine to five the busy the city the typical well, it's, job it's separating us from an i mean it's separating us from an ability to pick up on those cues i mean if you've never heard a cicada creak then you're not going to notice when they stop creaking so but what do you think it's doing to us as humans do you think it's a good thing you know moderate you know back to your kind of themes that you're well, exploring I, I think if you go from the purely rational theme it's it's uncharted waters because we've evolved for the caveman really and evolution has probably slowed down a lot since the industrial revolution now Mm. there is no survival of the fittest in western nations so and we're going into a place where you basically upload your consciousness probably to a computer soon enough and then battle ai as it tries to take over you know like so we're in waters that we've never been in before and you also seek comfort you know, like there's no there's no reason to be uncomfortable unless you put yourself. Oh in yeah, those, in, yeah, in, that's a that's a in modern you know tricky one. Yeah, what what why should you be uncomfortable? But yeah, if you if people that think that who always think that they failed if they're feeling uncomfortable are generally not very happy. Hmm. You know, from what I've seen. Why do you think that is? Because uh, I don't know. There's there's no there's no there's no lows and therefore there's no highs. You know, like adventuring is whilst you keep your main your brain jonesy like it, it, coming at a level like that's not up and down mm. much i find you know you do go through highs and lows and um you, those highs that you get you can't get anywhere else it's like it's better than drugs i mean i, I haven't yeah. really tried drugs so maybe i'm doing it the hard way <laughs> but you really you wouldn't get those highs if you just stayed at home and 
did nine to five all the time. Like another thing people I've, I've read and I agree that if, if you just have a repetitive life and you don't pack a lot into it, time feels like it's disappeared. You go, oh, don't know where this year's gone. Oh, last time I looked at it, well, I was 30 and now I'm 40. You know, whereas if you pack a whole bunch of stuff in, like, and you go, far out, if I go back to the start of the year, I did this, 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 and this, oh, it feels like it was ages ago. You know, whereas if someone doesn't fill their life with different sort of stuff, they just think it's it's just disappeared and the whole, you know, your whole life can disappear without, without knowing it. And adventures you know allow you to really draw life out and and that's I think what that's brilliant that's yeah, what 2020 has been like yeah. 2020 has been this year that people have like we're now in november end of almost end of november 2020 and people are like going where's this year gone for, for, for the most of people you know it's been a very bland year you know we've been trapped stopped from doing the things that we normally do in in your brain the way you should think about it your brain and this is physiologically the way your your brain marks memories it's like it puts it's a, it's like a a film counter like frames per second and it marks every time there's something kind of interesting cuz you need to do yeah. this from hunter gatherer days um, yeah. and so if you're on an adventure it's taking all these little snapshots and frames all these snapshots and frames so it makes time feel longer if there's nothing going on like what did you what did we what did we do today you know i'm i'm just thinking about it now because i was not that it's a negative thing i was stuck with the kids you know when i was inside the house i can't really remember too much of what we did but when i was outside when we were like releasing one of these relocated relocated quals that we had you know i've got so many thoughts and you know i bashed morgan in the head by accident with a with a with the backpack that i was carrying and and all this stuff you know there's no child abuse happening here um so yeah it's it's interesting modern society i think is is losing a lot of um that gut feel but it's been replaced and it's been replaced by this technological advancement. You look at Elon Musk with what he's doing with Neuralink. You look at that sort of stuff that's happening there. And I think we're on the cusp of, of, of a new hominid, you know, yeah. homo sapiens something um, yeah. that's going to be an amalgamation. Um, well, so the one thing that can't be replicated in AI is creativity and yeah, for creativity now. For, for now, but, but, <laughs> I think adventure and the way adventurers think is a very unique brain that can't be replicated because just like you said, Mike, you're always going, you know, I'm looking at 10 different options and analyzing them. Like there's no kind of straight path in adventure because anything could change at any point. And I think that's a wide range of thinking that a lot of people don't do when they're going, you know, like we used to live in Sydney, you go from Bondi to Martin Place every day in the city, you get your coffee at the same coffee place, you get into the office, you go to level 36, you have a meeting and you go back. I mean, literally, that is most people's life. They don't diverge from that. And so I think that we've lost some of that. Um, innate skill to assess the situation with those various brains maybe i mean i yeah, still think yeah. for me it's still very gut feel is a bodily function so i can't i keep for me there's like three systems going um what do you think i mean you were you there when your wife um gave birth out of yep. curiosity so what do you think about that because this is an interesting <laughs> one and then i know that we're going over time no no this, this I'm, I'm curious where are you really going changed my view on so i was very i think that i'm an intuitive gut feeler but then i was in business so i had to really force my analytical brain and it wasn't until i had kids that i was like holy shit my body has innate wisdom in it that i never even knew was there i in my mind i didn't know how to grow a baby yet i did it in my mind i didn't know how to have birth how to give birth and all of a sudden i'm like oh my god i'm going into labor and I had to get out of my mind because I was panicking like, oh, my God, this thing is going to come out of my vagina. That's fucking crazy. Um, I mean, that is like that is crazy, yet it's so natural. But in your mind, that's crazy. And if you can calm your mind, your body can take over and it knows what it's doing. The baby comes out and it knows what it's doing to nurse. Where do you put that in the realm of instinct gut intelligence oh. well yeah i mean i'd say that gut feel wise just all that info is pre-programmed in there like like the dog that sniffs a snake for the first time and knows it's dangerous uh perhaps 
because we live in such a comfortable society with no risks of danger or discomfort, it's more foreign to people to be going through those things. Whereas That's even just a hundred years ago, you know, that people was no big deal. These you have, you'd be much going through much more physical hardship. So uh, maybe I don't know, but m- maybe women wouldn't have found it as daunting back then. I don't know. It's That's very difficult. It's dangerous for a man to comment on. No, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, don't don't mansplain. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's very very dangerous. But it is an interest. That is an interesting. Yeah, because we we are so comfortable that anything kind of out of the ordinary. Well, I'm going to speak for myself. That was very much my path. That things I I sought comfort and security. So anything out of that really knocked me. Um, and yeah. it wasn't until kind of. You know, seeking that deeper understanding of myself and then that deeper understanding of resilience to say, okay, well, how do I make myself stronger that I started to step out of that? But it took me till I was late thirties to do it. Yeah. Have you guys, uh, there's a, something that helped me with, um, adventuring or doing discomfort things that aren't comfortable with, um, with my wife, for example, is that me growing up, particularly the military background, you always step on emotions. And if, if I'm carrying a heavy pack, and it's tiring and I'm scared. Just mm. no one wants to hear wins. Just shut up and do it with no emotion. That helps everybody because we don't have to listen to wins anymore. But if you're not the kind of person that grows up in that environment, and let's say you're um, an environment where you're at home, if something's upsetting you, it's good to talk about it because mm. that makes it better. So that's why, is it, you know, if my wife's feeling hot or tired, she's going to tell me straight away because that stops things from, that, that solves the problem. Whereas in my upbringing and sort of the adventure upbringing, the the response to um, hardship is to just shut up. So, and so it's easy to think, oh, this other person is just being selfish, but they're not. They're just reacting with it the way that generally works best in their environment. But those reactions are different, you know. So that's it. I I actually had that question. What's one thing um, that you've learned out there in adventure (laughs) that you practice at home or that you've brought home? Uh, definitely helps resetting your baseline for what's comfortable and what's not, what you appreciate. Uh, that lasts for several months, depending on how difficult it was. I mean, the Kimberley, I still find myself just going, oh, well, it's not as bad as that. You know, like when you do something really uncomfortable, really dangerous, you know, you've got another baseline to go, well, that's nothing. Um, but just, just the luxuries of, turning on a tap and stuff like that, they, mm. they fade pretty quickly. But mm. but safety uh, is something that you're just like, well, at least I'm safe, you know. I'm not about to die all the time or I don't have to I don't have to constantly engage my brain to stop myself from dying, um, albeit an unreasonable risk of dying. So, yeah, appreciation is probably the biggest thing it, it helps you out with. I like that. That's interesting. I don't know. Do you agree? What do you reckon, James? You know, when you get back, I mean, that those Antarctic expeditions that you did, that that pretty long and uncomfortable. Mm. Um yeah, brutal. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, like th- th- thirty kilos weight loss in in three months. Um, you're bleeding from your backside when you go to the toilet. You're not happy. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, you come back. You come back. Yeah, there is an appreciation for the small things that you take for granted on a day to day basis. But you're right. You forget that. Um, I-, I think there's there's a deepening of a well. You know, you it's like you're digging a freshwater spring in your body, and there's there's you've you. Each time you do something harder, un- unless you break, um, you're digging that well deeper so that you have more resources for the future and you come back, um, yeah, with more capacity. And I think every time you push yourself in a hard, uncomfortable environment, you're developing capacity. And I think that's why everyone should lean into being uncomfortable. Um, I-, I really do. Um, coming back sort of a little bit full circle, like we, we touched off at the very start talking about like Lauren sort of having a go at you, not having a go at you, but kind of no, having I'm, a go I'm at you. Really, you I, no, because it's really, I, I a really, debate, you know, the debate around the sort of intuition. I want got. to understand that brain because I think it's really interesting. And I, it's funny that people's brains function so differently than your own. And I think it's, it's, I've always wanted to be more in that kind of military headspace. Although I know if I was in war, I would just dig a hole and hide I, in it. I actually well. I don't really consider myself to be a very military space person. But it might sound a bit funny, but um, I don't know. I, I was in the army for eleven years, but I, I never felt like I was an army person. Hmm. Um, but uh, how I don't know. so? <laughs> 
I don't know, and I still don't understand how people in the army think a lot of the time. Like they just they they think quite differently to what to what I do. Um, mm. Not so much pilots, but the rest of the army. It's just they they have different different things turn them on, you know. Like and I, whereas I just think oh, I don't I don't really have any interest in that. It's not, I don't judge them for it. I just I just mm. don't get what they're motivated about. Um, you know, so if, yeah, I don't know. I, I sort of I've, I don't know. I'm probably slightly different from the average military mindset. I don't know, but there's a whole bunch of different people in the military, and so you, you can't fit everybody in the in the same, in the same Actually, hole. Yeah, you're you're what? You're early forties. Yeah, because yeah. you would be interesting for you actually, because you would have come in um, in the start of your career. You would have seen a different breed of pilot, you know, to the to the crop that sort of comes in now. Like there'd probably be there's a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot of differences in terms of the, the what you're required to do as a pilot is very different now. I suppose to the you know the fly so by fly by wire guys. Really, it's in many ways it's easier like a lot of the simple tasks are taken care of. So it, if it depends what you're doing, like it's, it changes a lot. The helicopters, well, yeah, everything's gone a lot more digital. Um, some things it's easier, some things it's harder, but I'm, I'm constantly impressed by the guys that come through. Uh, you know, they're just, some of them are like really, really talented dudes, way more talented than I am. And uh, they're still really humble, you know, really nice guys to get along with, so. Many women. Uh, I'm guessing maybe maybe ten percent, mm. um, but they enjoy it. And you know, like probably the the best boss I had in the army was uh, was, a, was a girl. She did an excellent job. So um, they're just as capable. Mm. Uh, yeah. But before we come back to gut feel, what did, what did you fly then? I mean, like what what, what are you talking um, what craft? Uh, I started out on Kiowas, which. Yep. Um, yeah, like in basically the Channel Seven helicopter painted green, uh, and then I went across to the RAF, uh, instructed for the RAF, which is a bit weird because I was an army guy, but, um, instructed there for a few years, and then um, they gave me a crack at fast jets, so I went over, flew the Hawk, flew the Hornet for a bit. I didn't even, I didn't actually make it right through the end of my Hornet course. Basically, my uh, mental capacity capped out uh, on the latter stages of that training, um, and then I went back and flew. Uh, the slightly smaller hawk for a bit, and then went on to the wedge tail, which is like a a waxy looking thing. Um, and then I went to Saudi and instructed uh, over there. Um, something I do want to point out: so I've been lucky to fly all sorts of different things, and choppers are all at low level. And then, you know, the bigger aircraft are at high level, and you, you're looking out over the landscape, and I, you really do notice a lot of environmental damage happening all around Australia, whether it's land clearing in Queensland. Um, you know, I think one of those pics in there, there's a shot of me flying a, a hawk just looking out the wing there. There was a trip from um, Perth to Sydney and I remember flying between Adelaide. Yeah, that one there. So I'll try um, and make it smaller. That doesn't really show the ground, but you know, between Adelaide and Sydney, like it's almost completely cleared other than the national park as you get close to Sydney. Other than like a, a small square kilometre of, of bush that's been left over in between the farmland. So the whole landscape's changed. And then you get to Sydney and it's this big sprawling octopus that's spread out all over the place. And and my perspective was, wow, look how much we've changed the planet. But my mate who was flying the other aircraft, um, we were just chatting on the on the intercom, well, the, the UHF radio between aircraft. And he was like, no, nah, man, to me, when I'm up here, I, I see this and I think, oh, we're so small, it doesn't really make a difference. So we're both looking at exactly the same thing, yeah. coming up with completely different conclusions. So... I find that interesting, but to me, it's pretty obvious that we've trashed the joint. Really. Oh, we're definitely terraforming it, not for the best. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, terraforming yeah. is a good word because that's what it looks like. Yeah, it really is. It's it's, it's space. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, we're we're morphing into something else, and it's interesting. We're we're going to morph into a place that you know we're not going to be the dominant life form because we're not going to be able to survive. So it's an interesting choice. Um, terraforming. Yeah, we're we're bacteria. We're just growing our colony. Sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, Lauren just said we're cancer, and I think yeah, that's probably pretty apt. Um, now, sorry, I just want to come back to gut feel for a second because this is this I, I am hyper fascinated about it as well. Like every time I go diving, I do a lot of spear fishing, and yeah. it's it's an interesting thing that I I do a check. You know, like Lauren does her checks. You know, her three three parts of her body with it turns to make it feel sense. I do a check to a degree, like because you jump in the water and sometimes it can feel super sharky. You know, and and you're like, oh, it's, it feels super sharky. But then, for me, I have to do this check whether it's my head 
that's just going overboard with imagination and it's like it makes me you know start seeing things in the corner or whether there is a gut feel that it feels super sharky and yeah. and and it's funny if i if i work out that it's my head and i know it's the wrong way around but I, if it's just these implanted things because there's been a shark attack up in queensland that's happened you know the past week and this at the other and i and i look at where those emotions are coming from and it realizes my brain and imagination running away with me then i'll continue yeah. diving but if it's something that i can't put my finger on and i'm yeah. like there's something about the situation i don't like these facts and that's it's my brain processing the fact is the time of day, the, 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 the sort of turbidity of the water. So how much the, what the visibility is, how green it is, um, yeah. what kind of wildlife's around. If I can hear whale sounds in the background, then that sets me off even more because you know that whites are going to be following the whales. Um, and I'll never forget, we went up to Byron Bay. And we had three days up there and I took my spearfishing gear because I was like, I need to get in. There's this place where there's meant to be great jewfish, you know, and went down and the day had gotten away. So it was not great. To, it was it was the afternoon and I was jumping on a cliff entry on the east coast of Australia. So the sun's coming behind the cliff, even though it's still daylight. I'm like, oh, it's going to be awkward because I'm not going to be able to see great, you know, but I'll still do it. I've come all this way and there's just something just felt wrong. And then there was media that they'd spotted uh i think 32 bull sharks down near ballina and i was like okay is that in my brain you know and i was i was trying to fire myself up and like everyone was telling me to go not to do it and i was about to jump in and i was like nah fuck you've come all this way you got to do it and just as i'm about to jump in the water this shark just swims through a wave <laughs> and i'm just like yeah i'm not going in I'm, I'm, I'm staying out but it's just I was fighting my body so hard like my brain was just trying to override everything that was just telling me to abort um, yeah. and I think that's that's the instinct you have to listen to uh, yeah, whether my it's my brain's constantly running through exactly the same stuff when I go snorkeling yeah. Well. So, yeah 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 I never well I, not to say I never when, you, when you're in for a long time you can just sort of get in the zone where you sort of switch off to that risk but particularly when you're first getting in it take, yeah, I think about it a lot yeah, and when when variables change, and when whenever variables change, that's when you should really think about it. Like, sort of, if, if it is in the water, if you're swimming out of uh, a different sort of area, so like you've been on proper reef and you're actually going down the side, then you get all these different currents that happens. Every time you change a variable on an expedition, you should think about what flow-on effect that has. Um, and, and I imagine that's something that runs through your mind a lot. Now, I, I am conscious of time, but you, uh, your YouTube channel, what's your YouTube channel? Because like that's, um, I've watched a couple of your videos and they are pretty damn co- cool. So what's the, uh, what do people search? Uh, Apple, Lawrence. Easy. YouTube. Done. Yeah. All right. That's, uh, pretty simple. Lawrence, you want to do a, one of your little, little rappies? Well, I just, I actually just have a couple okay, quick, here we go. Sorry, quick questions, um, instead of the wrap up, but just if you have like one thing or one word or one phrase throw it at us because i think it's kind of pulling out these amazing experiences that you have if you're willing to share so i think if there's one thing that you would recommend taking or never leaving behind when you head out on an adventure what would that thing be Uh, a survival adventure or just a, a normal adventure um for Actually, both, average both, person, both, 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 both. And matches. No, knife okay, and matches. Yeah. Okay. okay. Knife, knife and, matches. and a light. A light is better than matches. Okay. So knife and matches. And what about a normal adventure? Which, you know, for some people is a survival. Some people in the Blue Mountains, two nights would be a survival. So what would you suggest? Uh, yeah. Knife and if, matches? Well, if, if it's for... Uh, if it's for comfort, bring some alcohol. If it's, <laughs> if, it's uh, if it's to stay comfortable, have, have one of those little bivy bag, um, uh, you know, silver blankets, space blanket sleeping bags. They weigh oh, yeah. nothing. Um, oh, yeah, because when you're really wet and cold, it sucks. Good advice. One thing that you would definitely leave behind. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, uh, I leave lots of stuff behind these days heavy stuff like um <laughs> stuff you well, i want to say stuff you don't need like just take one bowl like don't take a whole cut set of cutlery you just need mm. one bowl and a spoon with a sharp edge on it. yeah yeah <laughs> that's an interesting evolution like the whole idea of like when i was a kid it was a knife fork and spoon it's like do you really need all of them you can just get away it's the spoon's the most important thing really i mean like to 
you know, you can make anything else really if you're eating it. <laughs> and then the third one, best advice anyone's ever given you. Uh, bite off more than you can chew and chew like buggery. I like that. Yeah, that's good. That's a really good. I think that's a pretty good way to. Well, your second last question, Lauren, I was going to say, leave your ego behind. That's good. Yeah, because I mean, like that's 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 uh, I, you see so many people go into the bush, and I think when they bring their ego, I mean, that's like you, you mentioned it before. Actually, at the very start of this whole thing, you you make mistakes. It overrides gut 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 feel. Ego can um, makes you bad make bad bad yeah. bad decisions. Um, yeah. So leave that behind, and also um, take your emotional baggage with you because you can unpack it there and leave it behind. <laughs> but but don't don't <laughs> let it yeah inform your decisions. <laughs> unpack it in the bush um, yeah, a good now I gotta ask you the question that we started off this whole thing uh, who would you want to see in the hot, hot seat who's another adventure thinker out there that you'd like to put in your seat right now uh, John Muir oh god yeah, everyone everyone be, oh, like Eric Phillips last week said John Muir because yeah. um, he's really good friends with him but he's just uh, like so analog that bloke he's so analog like it have doesn't to have the, the tech stuff you mean. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, maybe there's a way I could get Susie, his, his, his missus, to, to, to jump in on this and help us out, help out with that. But um, yeah, no, I think we'd have to go visit him. I think we'd have to go. And I'd love to. I mean, Laura and I caught up with him about, what, a year and a half ago. He told us all about his chickens, his hens. Oh, yeah. He's straight about his chickens. Um, but he's, he's yeah, I've, I'm a huge fan of him. Is it yeah, that book... Um, that- yeah, the book and the same feeling alone across Australia. Like that, Epic. Sort of best best one-hour doco I've ever seen, I reckon. Given yeah. your connection to Indigenous culture, is there anyone... We haven't had somebody... Like, who... who... Actually, someone from Norfolk. Norfolk, Norfolk, Norfolk. Do you have anyone there that, that that you think would be an interesting person to talk to? Because, like, that's... that's Like, I know I, you're the second person or maybe third person I know of that's that's gone through that. Uh, yeah, I could have a think about it offline. That, um, you, yeah, like if you're not so much talking about adventurers. Like I can't actually think of any. No, just are. just somebody that has the. I mean, I think I would be very interested to speak to some some like we haven't had. Um, I guess to have it would be very interesting for me to hear more stories from indigenous people about the way that they think um yeah, yeah well, you know. I'll, I'll have a think about it um like sort of one guy sort of comes to mind i know it's a different okay. how they share their stories is not in this context but i'm just if there's anything that comes to mind i would find that i i, I agree that their knowledge is immense and needs to be shared and it would be great to kind of bring that lens in if possible yeah okay cool i'll, I'll think well, on it and... well maybe it's the perfect way to share that because i mean it's a narrated oral history mm. and like here this is that's that's kind of kind of what we're doing i mean it's an interesting one um mm. yeah definitely i mean if there's any like that's something that's something that, that maybe i'm just a little bit too naive of like i can go off and think of sort of historical um uh, figures and sort of in, indigenous explorers and adventurers, but yeah, modern day that'd be fascinating. If anyone's got any suggestions, please, please, please send us an email and, and give us a heads up because that would be phenomenal. Um, yeah, but um, Mike, anything you want to sort of like raise or say? I mean, like if people want to find you, as you mentioned, they can jump on that. Uh, oh, wow, yes, wow, yes. we're bad parents. Our daughter just walked in. Let's. <laughs> Yeah, so you can find me on uh, yeah, Outback Mike. I think Instagram is Outback underscore Mike. Oh, that's on do that. Um, YouTube. Uh, yeah. We can, we can put it all up. And um, just what? definitely people should check out your documentary just for the pure, um, the the imagery and the experience was really, it's, it's definitely worth viewing if you, have any interest in Australian outback and kind of minimalist adventure. And I loved that, how you were able to do kind of keep it real and keep it authentic. Also, thanks sorry. Thanks to you guys for this show. It's, it's been really good. Like I, like I basically listen to an episode and then work on the dog for another, the 
the dog, the log, the d- another few days with an axe. And I just think about the last episode. So there's heaps of really good gouge coming out. Gouge is a, an, a military piloting term for good information. So I like that. Good information gouge. that you're drawing gouge. out. Of, um, Let's put that in that vernacular alone. And, and we don't, and, and have you said, so you are currently digging out a canoe. People can see yeah. this on your Instagram because we've been watching a couple of your videos. But yeah. can you give us a little, um, just a little teaser of, of what that's all about? The, the, I know yeah, you talked well, about it, but but when it, do you go? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, okay, the timeline. next dry season, yeah. Probably, so basically April, I'm, I'm thinking, if I can get it yeah, ready okay. by then. Cool. And uh, yeah, probably take me two, two months. Two months. Yeah, so yeah five meter, four ton Norfolk pine log, and it's going to have two outriggers. Hopefully, a pretty cool looking sail. And I'm going to have all historic stuff, equipment from 1846, so like a possum skin rug and you know sextant and all the same stuff that this dude had. Very cool. Oh, yeah. I'm actually trying to like whilst you're talking, I'm trying to actually get a, a little a little snippet of it up of you digging away at it because like seriously you said at the start of this call offline like you're in the probably the best shape your upper body has been in yeah. <laughs> mate it looks brutal yeah it's pretty it is pretty satisfying and, and gut feels helpful so you don't cut yourself because i'm using like really sharp axes and, and i'm using some power tools as well to speed things up and uh and uh, when i'm swinging the axe i just go oh don't don't swing the axe this way because i know and then I look at it and I analyze it and I see that I would have hit myself in the ankle. So I just, um, yeah, gut feels. Are you? Off. So this is just you just whacking away. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that. Seriously. Yeah, yeah. And that's this special um, slider I got now, which is pretty cool. I don't know. It might be too heavy to take on the expedition, but it's amazing that you can, like, that's, that's me operating the camera. I basically, I, I program it robotically first and then I jump into the shot. <laughs> And I have to keep sticking things in place to focus on. And then I run over and then jump in the shot and stuff. Yeah, I mean, the effort it takes to video, to go back, set it up, walk through, video it, that's amazing in itself. So you're doing a documentary on your next adventure as well. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So this is the start of it. So yeah. I'm building this canoe for, for that expedition. Yeah. Um, as- yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was watching this one the other day. Um now, every, to anyone who's actually going to make a documentary, because I, I get a lot of comments having made a couple of documentaries, um, and a couple of them have done, you know, done pretty well. Um, the they say, you know, it's like, oh, what should I do? How should I? How should I go about it? Look, look at this documentary. Watch it. I mean, seriously, emulate, emulate uh, <laughs> Mike's style because, like, the the I was once given a great piece of advice, and I think you probably are living it more than anyone else if you don't film it didn't happen so the coverage you get is 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 phenomenal and the second piece of advice that i can give um is that it doesn't really matter what you shoot something on like don't get me wrong it does but it doesn't matter what you shoot something along as long as it's compelling you can shoot it on a roller sticker tape just as long as you capture it um so so mike Thank you for doing what you do. Make more films. Um, your, your YouTube channel, jump on that, have a listen. I love the way that you sort of like are engaging, explaining what's going on. And um, yeah, awesome work breaking down that fourth wall straight away in that documentary and making it work so well. So that's that's phenomenal. And thank you for also showing this awesome connection to nature, to indigenous culture and to ourselves. Because I think that there's a lot that people can reconnect with when they listen to their gut whether that sits in your head or your heart or your body just the fact that you're following this um unconscious and conscious line and living your life to the fullest i think what you said is amazing which is you know if if you don't do something different you just lose your time and making the most out of your life is is something that you definitely show an example of so thank you for inspiring us and it makes me want to go to the Kimberleys. So that's on our list as well. Thanks. Um, Thank you. Mike, stay online. We're just going to just quickly wrap up and then, and then we'll and then say, say goodnight. Um, but no. Oh, geez. Here we go. No, Mo- I don't Mo- want to go to bed. Morgan, do you realize you're, 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 you're on now? <laughs> Everyone's listening to you through the microphone. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, if anyone's Thank got any guys. thoughts on who we should have on, Okay, this is going. It's chaos. This is really chaos. We're yeah. Anyway, we're signing off. But 
Outback Mike, check him out. Absolutely awesome. Uh, if you've got a thought on who we should have next, send us an email, jump on the link, watch the other episodes. Uh, and next week, we have someone super cool. So this one's... Um, uh, next week is going to be episode 20 and we have the... Alexander Gammy, uh, who anyone who's watched the Crossing the Ice out, uh, documentary is going to know, is the awesome Norwegian who Cass and I were racing across Antarctica. So he's going to be his episode's going to be going to air on 12 p.m. on Friday. It is a pre-record again, but seriously, check it out. He is a crackpot. He is awesome. But Outback Mike, thank you so much Thanks for taking the time. Story. Let's wrap this up, Lauren, because we are all very tired. All right. <laughs> See you later. See you next week. Good night.